Quark is dead. Long live Quark. Plus, O'Brien knocks up a co-worker. Today, we talk about Deep Space Nine, Season 4, Episode 24, Body Parts. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Keith and Mike. Watch Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Today we're talking about Season 4, Episode 24, Body Parts. Mm -hmm. uh, the things we complained about most after we turn 40. We only have one episode left in Season 4. Mike, how's, it, how's Season 4 going for you now that we're almost at the end? It feels so long. Uh, we're, we're pushing through. We're getting there. I'm excited to see where we're going this episode, interestingly, doesn't really set us on a course anywhere. For a moment, towards the tail end, I thought we might be two-partering, and I thought that was like, I mean, I spoiler alert, I like this episode, but I don't know that it was two-parter good, uh, and it didn't do that. So, well, it wasn't. It, no. you're, you're like imaginary shade. It turned it, turned it back, uh, it, it tied it all up nicely. This does not feel like a Marvel feature film. No, although they, they don't even like, they're not even cliffhangers anymore in movies. They just stop. And you got to wait two years. That's how movies go. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about season five. I feel like they've placated enough. It's time to just let's go to war. Let's Star Wars this itch, and let's do it. Oh, all right. Well, uh, we'll we'll see. We will see. But before we get into all of that. We have to talk about last week's episode, The Quickening, mm. and you have uh, the viewers here and the patrons who get their comments read, or at least pieces of them read, uh, right here on the YouTube, had a lot of thoughts about The Quickening, starting with our patron Joshua Cronin, who says, this episode definitely is Whoa. one... Oh, oh I, I blinked out of... Ex oh, I, <laughs> You're I, back. I, uh, what's, uh, uh, I blinked... What's the Marvel one? I dusted... Mm -hmm. You snapped? I, snapped the blink was it called the blink i think it might have been the blink the blink i blinked anyway josh says uh this episode is definitely you a one off <laughs> from the general arc that is happening coming but it's a great one-off does great character building for bashir i give it 86 self-sealing stem bolts never mind never mind it when it comes up on my rewatch Super cool hearing your story about watching Deep Space Nine, Keith, about watching uh, the Deep Space Nine for the first time on my iPod video. I, too, started it when I was 13 when it came out and watched it uh, for the first three or four years when I graduated high school. College happened and I moved away from home. It wasn't until the early 2000s that I bought it on DVD and finished watching it all the way through. And it was my favorite trek in the 90s and still is to this day. I think a lot of people have the common experience with Deep Space Nine, where they watch the first two or three seasons, you know, it it was nothing like it became. So, you know, life happened, college happened, they all moved on, and they sort of, you know, didn't, didn't keep up with what was happening on the show, only to find out 10 years later, when people are like, oh my God, Deep Space Nine, I'm like, well, Deep Space Nine was fine. I'm like, oh no, no, you need to go back and watch it. And then our people are blown away by the last uh, half of Deep Space Nine. Keith, is that comment over? Yes. Okay, I would like, can I tell quickly, can we have story time, can I tell you my experience watching Deep Space Nine in my early years? I believe that is the entire concept of the show. Keith, there was one episode that I did watch back in the day. Really? I, and I, I meant, I, I, in fact, I may have brought this up in our first season, but I'll quickly tell you, I remember because of Armin Shimmerman's face, right? Because the Quark character is so very identifiable. Sure. And they used him all over the marketing. I remember this, I have this memory floating in my gray matter of sitting down in front of the TV, flipping through, and pausing on an episode of television in which the following was happening, okay? Okay. This is all that's been in my head as we're watching Deep Space Nine. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So we haven't seen this episode yet. No, it's... The Quark character sitting at like a conference room table, all right? Okay. And then being having his neck snapped and falling into some porridge by like a gray, by like a green guy and 
then they zoom out and it turns out he's just like sh like showcasing him ways to die. That's all I remember. We got here. It's the only scene I remember. You must have been so excited. Oh, very excited. You can, the watch along, which you can join at KM, uh, patreon.com slash KM. Uh, it was so weird. It was a little out of body. It, it, the fact that I still have that neuron is a little weird, but we got there. We're here. And now I uh. feel like my whole Star Trek. Uh, journey has the circles have have touched it's it's all come together yeah. we are forming the uh, the avengers i love it oh that's that's interesting however in my remembering mm -hmm. the character doing the killing was ducat so that was the only thing that got flipped well but like a cardassian and another cardassian to someone who's only seen 10 minutes of one episode mm -hmm. and this was 20 30 years ago like i think and that's I feel pretty like good we're that introduced to ducat uh, first in Deep Space Nine, uh, Ducat is in the pilot. Garrett so I comes think in, the in my brain, episode. like I rewrote that. That makes sense. Memory because he's the first Cardassian I saw. So anyway, that's okay. my story, and uh, now all right. it's all new. Now it's all new. It's all <laughs> the one spoiler <laughs> is over. In Mike's... That's awesome. Can you believe? By the way, between mm -hmm. the internet, the companion, all the stuff, can you believe? Because no, I'm sure there's some big things about to happen in the next couple seasons, like shockers, and I know nothing. I am I am completely unsullied. If you write a comment that sullies anything for me, Keith will find your I house. will come for you. I will <laughs> I will come to your house and I will slap the comment out of your mouth. Yep. That is 100% what's gonna happen. He's proven it. He's proven it time I, and time again. But look, I our, our com. you know what? We, we were discussing this earlier today uh, on the, or not today, this week, uh, on this and the other shows, right? Our comments here are a safe space. They are a safe space for everybody. We do not deal with mean people and people who are critical for no reason. You know, we don't put up with any kind of uh, phobias or, or or anything like that. Like we're this is a safe space. Everyone should be safe. Whatever, unless you're doing spoilers, and I will smack you down. Yeah, that's so, not that's not cool. No spoiling it for Mike. All right, so uh, we continue with Jason Mo, another one of our patrons. Uh, who says, Keith, I was fully expecting you to end your confession about watching it on the uh, iPod by raising a small flask of whiskey and saying, so I will learn to live with it because I can live with it. I can live with it. Computer, erase that entire personal log. Mike, will, this quote will make sense to you in just two more seasons. Uh, luckily, you won't remember any of this. Uh, was it too uh, it was. It was not. It's not too cut. But hold on to your butt for that one. Holy moly! Anyway, he says. I think the quickening is an outstanding episode of Deep Space Nine, as Mike's mentioned. It's definitely a de detour from the main story in some ways. That's why I really miss the old days of twenty-five episode seasons instead of the ten episode seasons. So we could get back to interesting side stories like this one that don't necessarily have to play into the larger tapestry as very much. Uh, 95 stem bolts for me. P.S. I went back and looked at the matte painting on the Paramount Plus broadcast and it looked similarly wonky to me. We also got a comment from YouTube viewer, welcome back, yeah. who left a super tip and a, uh, a, a super tip and a novel. I'm excited. Here are some highlights from it. Uh, starting just with excerpts I now these days? <laughs> well, just hold on. Okay. Just wait. Okay. <laughs> So YouTube viewer says, I uh, patron, who not only a patron, also left a separate super tip. So Ooh. much appreciated. Uh, I can't miss your take on the quickening, though. It's one of my all-time favorite Deep Space Nine episodes. For an episode called The Quickening, you guys had an unnecessarily <laughs> long intro, taking 20 minutes to get to the episode. Usually you guys take 15 minutes. Well, guess what? Today's probably going to be 25. Yep. And York. Partly to blame. Chapters so, below. Chapters below. Chapters below. <laughs> Here are some random thoughts as I watched your video. Go back in episode Wayun is supposed to be super creepy. I don't know if you've ever seen Jeffrey Combs as a voice actor in an animated series or video games, but creepy is sort of his forte. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I we were saying he wasn't supposed to be creepy. Of course he's creepy. That's uh, that's Wayun. The guest stars playing Akoria and Trevian were freaking amazing. Agreed. Uh, this is what good... Speaking of, th this is literally happening to me right now in my life. I don't know why I'm out of focus. Uh, about Charlie, who was being 
personally abused by my doing a podcast right now. I think that's why you're out of focus, because he's been jumping and bouncing behind you, and the the Mm -hmm. camera's trying to... It's like, that's the action. Yeah, (laughs) for sure, for sure. He is calling Sarah McLaughlin because I'm here uh, talking to you. But the YouTube viewer says cats are destructive because they have a lot of pent-up rage. They're nature's perfect killing machine, but God or Charles Darwin put them in tiny eight-pound bodies. That is very true, and I think... The fact that uh, Charlie is an indoor cat and only occasionally gets to disembowel things. Who's the non sequitur now, YouTube viewer? (laughs) Uh, They continue in a perfect television series. Terry Farrell would give someone her hair clip at the start of every episode. Wear a hair down for Dax. Fair enough. It makes perfect sense that a doctor in the Utopian Federation would be opposed to medically assisted suicides. Yes and no. Be, uh, in this is Keith talking, uh, like I think that um, yes, a utopian, you know, society with medicine, you would always have hope that a cure is coming, and you'd have that sort of confidence. But I think ethically, you know, allowing people to make their own choices in under certain circumstances would be part of the federation. Uh, it's interesting, but I, I mean, what do you know? It's a difficult and complicated subject. So uh, he continues, given her spirituality, I imagine Kira is pretty comfortable by herself for long periods of time. This is wondering what she did for a a week on uh, the runabout. Also, as a former resistance fighter, she probably had to camp in boring remote places for long periods of time. That's a good point. Uh, Continue to say, as I was, uh, you know, giving shade to the painting uh, of uh, Zakoria's husband painting is harder than it looks i'd like to see you do better i i most assuredly could not do better i would do much much worse but uh to be fair i don't claim to be a painter so i'm very bad okay. at painting at painting i can sketch a little bit uh when i was uh my my older brother sean is a tremendous artist he's very uh, talented He's, well, he's a remarkably talented person. But uh, I would sketch in my uh, my textbooks in college and in all of my friends' textbooks in college as well, which is why none of them could return them. Uh, anyway, pointing out that this episode had no bad guy, but everyone was flawed, was very insightful. Death was a huge part of art and culture during Earth's Black Plague. The Dance Macabre is very famous. Yes. I would say Trevian's anti-hubris would be nihilism. Insightful comment, even if you had semantics issues. Yes, that was the word I was searching for and did not find. Thank you for uh, for doing that. Um, Yeah, I I think that's I think that's exactly right. I like that Bashir views this episode as a failure, not a success. That is a huge character arc. It took Deep Space Nine four and a half seasons, but they finally got me to stop thinking of Bashir as a horny dum-dum and catapulted him into one of my favorite characters. This episode is why I like Dr. Bashir far more than I like McCoy, Crusher, the Zimmerman hologram, and Phlox. I mean, I I think uh, the holographic doctor rivals him in terms of the character development, but I think um, I think Bashir might have the most character development of all of the of all the doctors for sure. I don't see it likely that the Dominion is going to make a reprisal against the planet for daring to cure the disease. Remember, the Dominion's only real weakness is their arrogance. Every time the Federation figures out how to counter one of their weapons, the Dominion leaders are surprised. Hmm. They probably didn't consider that anyone could cure the disease. In any event, the planet will never forget what happened when they opposed Dominion. And given that Bashir is on a humanitarian mission and the Federation is so big on humanitarian missions, I'm guessing no one had a problem with what Bashir was doing. Even if he hadn't failed, Sisko would commend him for trying. Good point. Rene seems to be the director on some of the Deep Deep Space Nine best episodes. Given this is a Bashir-centric episode and it is near perfect, I don't mind that Dax and everyone else had very small roles. 98.6 out of 100 self-sealing stem bolts. JD chimes in with, Keith, I'm coming to take the TV monitors away out of my cold, dead hands, JD. Out of my cold, dead hands. They're bolted to the wall. 
Yes, I do respond in real time. You just need to be in the room with me. I can imagine. I noticed you hadn't done Geekly, but that's none of my damn business. Well, we're, we, we're having an announcement when we get through all these comments. Uh, and the best one for me is in the end. Bashir in his office still working, not giving up. And we do learn in a future episode, he's still working on it and would not give up. This was serious for him. This is a great episode. I think there's something uh, that I got left out of the conversation, but it is strong. I go 88, self-sealing stem bolts, wharfs, big old boot shivs, also a patron, gives it an 84 saying great Duck episode, we are starting to see what I consider Bashir's final form, and I'm here for it. 84 stumbolts, I said, bring back KM Geekly. Kevin Miles gives it a 94, says, I miss not seeing Geekly for the past few weeks. <laughs> I know, oh. I know. Uh, <laughs> oh, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you, do you want to tell him? So seen, so Mike? seen. Mike, tell him. We heard you, y'all. We tried to silently Kevorkian and geekly. I tried to choke it out slowly and, and gently, gently, gently choke out um, KM Geekly. Look, the analytics don't lie. It's it's not a popular show. Uh, <laughs> but popular doesn't necessarily have to define important. And it's important for us to have a, a space to do nonsense that isn't Trek. And uh it's important for you to to hear us talk about those things. So uh <laughs> Is it well, I don't know. Important might have been the wrong choice. Uh, <laughs> so we just decided to spin off to a secondary channel, a more of a, a catch-all, a pop culture catch-all channel. Uh, I've had some ideas for it, but for now it's just Geekly, and uh, we'll see whatever else we want to throw on there. So Trek stuff will be here on Keith and Mike Entertainment on YouTube. And if you want to check out k and Geekly and some other nonsense, you can go to... I, it's linked below. It's linked on our main show, but it's youtube.com slash at k and m geekly and uh, subscribe there you'll have two separate feeds we're still our lovely voices and uh that's that there it is so ryan chesley points out uh yeah uh about uh my revelation about the podcast revelation of the century by watching uh deep space nine on that tiny little screen. And finally, Mysterious Anne says, even as a detour episode, The Quickening is a great example of how Deep Space Nine develops into a show of arcs within arcs. This episode isn't a simple continuation of the action from last week, but it is a beautiful callback and uh, to and continuation of the pilot episode and Dr. Bashir's naive colonialist take on frontier medicine. It feels like the show has been building this character development for four seasons. So the hubris, humility, humility, and growth we see in this episode is extra believable and really feels momentous for the character and the show. 93 stem bolts from me. All right. Yeah. I spent some time after the episode because it got fed to my YouTube channel. And like you said, and Terry Farrell had her hair down, so I'd watch her do anything before. As I guess it was during the first season or early on, I think it was before it aired, they did a behind the scenes Welcome to Deep Space Nine, hosted by Terry Farrell, walks you around the set, but they only ever show clips from Emissary. So sure. you get to see original Bashir and his sort of uh, Yankee Doodle uh, <laughs> doctor, Dr. Doodle. Uh, so it's doodle doctor. it's really interesting because they can't say much because the show hasn't aired, but also right. they're trying to get people interested. But it's just they're like, get Terry to do it and have her walk around yep. and be pretty. So uh, she's excellent. It's excellent. I'm going to start watching more behind the scenes stuff from previous seasons. All right. There's your... uh, because I will slap the spoilers out does, of your mouth. It does add context. And I find myself being a fan now. And that's what fans do. Right. But if we didn't have unless unless you got the DVDs or the VHS compilations, you didn't get access to those things. Yeah, there's no, no YouTube. No. All yeah. right. All right. So what's next, you heard buddy? it here. I got to click Mike the button, so I need a little bit of help remembering. All right. So let's now talk about the episode. Hope you use those chapters, folks. Uh, if you find all of that less interesting, I find <laughs> it more interesting. So Body Parts aired on June 10th, 1996. We had a couple weeks off before the last two episodes of the season. However, the top song still the Crossroads, Bone Thugs and Harmony. Uh, can't wait to hear a little bit of that. Just make it less racist. <laughs> My little sister's birthday was June 13th. She was turning 13 
Mm-hmm. So uh, definitely was not listening to Bone Thugs in Harmony. Uh, so we'll, today we'll sing Bows, Hugs, and Birthday. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, uh, if that wasn't fantastic, let me tell you what was fantastic. Are you ready for this? Yeah, man. The top movie this week. I think one of the universe's greatest guilty pleasures. Oh. The Rock. The oh. Rock was the top movie. Who is the other? Who does he escape with in The Rock? It's Connery uh, and who? Sean escape, Connery. Escape from uh, Alcatraz. Because there's definitely no, two it's, of them. It's oh, it's uh, uh, no, no, no! It's uh, it's uh, it's exactly who you think it's gonna be. Um, oh, who is it? Hold on, Nicholas Cage. Oh, that, I just said that Cage. Oh, oh, I didn't hear and you. You said yeah. no. You just you're you're <laughs> you're your my, my default setting is, is no. No. <laughs> if I didn't hear what you said, I assume you're wrong. <laughs> oh man, that's great. <laughs> that is the damn truth. Uh, anyway, Ed Harris, oh, was so such good. a good movie. I think it's uh, bad, I, but good. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Guilty I pleasure. mean, I haven't, I haven't watched it in a long time. Maybe you know, I'm, I've got the house to myself for a couple of weeks. Going to crank up the, uh, the yeah. That might sound. find its way onto the Plex server, actually. I'm oh feeling yeah, like get, a, get, get a that. get a good version of that yeah. on the Plex. I, I'd like to watch that. All right, uh, Mike, what was on TV tonight? Heath, we're in the middle of the summer, so it's all repeats except for two things I want to highlight. The only thing new on network television was on Fox at 8.30 was a show called The Last Frontier, which I don't remember, but the, the show title was The One with the Friends Theme, which is interesting because that's airing on Fox. Friends was clearly an NBC property, so that was like a mm-hmm. interest. I'd love to know what that It's what a crossover parody, sure. Mm-hmm. Ratings, even though it's the only thing new on television, Keith, it was a it scored a 2.8 that night. So uh, uh, it was not just the one with the Friends theme. It was the one that sucked, apparently. Uh, the 2.8 today would be a giant hit. Uh, but, the uh, only other thing new was on, over on PBS. David Attenborough's Natural World was still cranking him out. This evening's episode was The Bat-Eared Fox. Wow. Okay. Well, there you go. So uh, enough of that nonsense. Let's do the hard-hitting news from the Weekly World News headline. We've got some... That's not it at all. Nope. That's Renee directing. Hey, it was, he was great. Thanks, Renee. He was great. Thanks, thanks again, Renee. And a 94-year-old Ohio woman has... Uh, oh, no, no, no. A Ohio woman has 94 <laughs> pounds of cellulite. I thought she looks great for 94. Oof. Uh, all right, so this episode was directed... By Captain, my Captain Avery Brooks directed this episode, who last directed Rejoined, and has a teleplay by Hans Beimler, who last wrote Shattered Mirror, and has a story by Louis P. DeSantis, not to sanctimonious, DeSantis, no relation, and Robert J. Bolivar, both of their only IMDb credits other than an animated short called The Toll. Uh, so I bet this was a story submission, uh, like uh, Star Trek used to do. What do you say we do? A, just a just a sous-son of trivial trivia. Now keep waste your time with what? With trivial trivia. Yes. Okay. Oh my God. I pulled up the Rock on IMDb, and there's like little clips going on. I'm so excited to watch yeah, I'll, that. I'll, I'll take care of that today. All right. Thank you. So this episode, Body Parts, the main story is loosely based on William Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Hmm. The storyline, and this this is, I think, I mean, uh, you probably gathered, but this is pretty uh, pretty fun. The storyline of Keiko O'Brien's baby having to be transferred to Major Kira's body was a clever way to allow Nana Visitor to continue working through her real-life pregnancy. As stated in the interview, she didn't want to have to stand behind tables or wear a lab coat as other actresses have had to do in similar situations. Uh, do you know uh, who was the uh, the other party in that baby? This had to be Bashir, right, at this point? It was our good Dr. Alexander Sittig. Uh, Nana gave birth to her son, Django El Tahir El Sittig, during the production of The Assignment in 1996 in season five, though her character would remain pregnant 
for a little longer. I will not give any more spoilers than that, but of course a new two-piece style of uniform for Major Kira was introduced to accommodate her pregnancy in this episode. Uh, amazing behind-the-scenes trivia there uh, and going maybe on. maybe one of, big picture, maybe one of the coolest how we going to deal with this pregnancy thoughts I've ever seen. I mean, it's this is where Star Trek is great because it gets sci-fi. Just like, sure, make it work. We can find a way to make this to, to make this happen. Uh, Some so, of the specifics, I have questions, but we'll. <laughs> oh yeah, there is a big old bucket of don't worry about it <laughs> yeah. in that in the sides of that. A hefty serving for sure. Uh, you know who uh, who we do worry about, Mike? Yeah. The people who worry about us and who help fund this walking nonsense. That's been, uh, <laughs> we got crap for going for 25 minutes. We're going for what, 40 now? Yeah, this is a big one. No, it's only been a half hour, and, and uh, since I'm going to cut 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, our patrons, we couldn't thank them enough. Brian Kimball Biersuk, Jason Moe, Peter Bank, Frank Wrench, Quarks Bar. We're going to get back to that. Joshua Cronin. We're going and- to spell that right next time. Andrew Hayes. By the way, Frank, uh, I think it's Frank? No. Uh, one of our patrons, Keith. It's mm-hmm. Secret. I'm not going to tell tell you too much. Might have reached out and might be sending something in the mail, and I don't know what it is. <gasps> Ooh, I love mail. So we'll see. Anytime someone asks for our PO box, I have to have a, a come to Jesus yeah, with them. <laughs> that, that that better be going to my PO box, not well, your. PO it will box. eventually get there. I know you're coming for WrestleMania, so anything that is of in Keith's wheelhouse is going to you. Anyway, uh, fair enough. Uh, by the way, good spell check over here. We need to look a couple more money for to hire an editor. Andrew Hayes and the mysterious Worf's big old we are chips, bar. Charles Babadge, Harry Potheads here on Productions, Nikolai Ivanovich, Lobachevsky, Delusions at Noon YouTube viewer, uh, the aforementioned James Hubbard, Chesley, Anguished, JD Mace, Anguished! Uh, Colin Dagan, Chris Mitchell, Pat, Joshua again, JD Lutz and Wyatt. JD, thanks for the shout out on your show about uh, podcasters that uh, inspire you. You inspire us right back, ma'am. Uh, you can join the team. It's patreon.com slash k and You get in for as low as a dollar, up to a million dollars we're accepting now. Uh, oh, up up to mm-hmm. a million and one dollars? Hard no. We will Can't reject do it. it. Can't do it. Up to a million, though. We'll take it. Yeah. Uh, we thank you. You do, I know it doesn't seem like it, but you do actually help the channel a great deal uh, by your donations and uh, your support. We appreciate you. You can join the team. Patreon.com slash k and we had another uh, yes. eight folks in the watch alongs last night, Keith. If you're not watching the show along with me every week, uh, what are you doing with yourself? I mean, living a life. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, fair enough. Fair if enough. You spend two plus hours watching does some forty year old man watch Deep Space Nine for the first time every week. You mm-hmm. got some spare time, it's clear. Well, you know, I, but not nearly as much as the forty year old man who set up a camera to allow people to watch him. It's true. That's true. All right, so uh, you know, uh, we've we've one more ad for for Quark's Bar that came in the uh, with the the ad package, and uh, created of course by AI. Step into Quark's Bar on Deep Space Nine, where the drinks are strong, the music is lively, and the fun never ends. Whether you are a seasoned Starfleet officer or a curious visitor from another quadrant, Quark's Bar is the ultimate spot for a good time in the galaxy. For our signature Klingon blood wines to our infamous Syntha Hall, our extensive drink menu is sure to please even the most discerning palate. Don't forget to try our exclusive Dabo game for a chance to win big! Dabo! So, why settle for ordinary when you can experience the extraordinary at Quark's Bar? Come join us today and make memories that will last a lifetime. Wow, well, there it is. I thought that was a pretty good ad read. Not bad, not bad. I'm telling you. Yeah, you're getting hey, good, buddy. Hey, uh, anyone want to hire me to, to actually do ad read? I'd really love to do that. This just in. No. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Our guest stars this week, Mike, it's such a good day for you because Rosalind Chow is back she as is. Keiko O'Brien. Max Grodenchuk is here as Rom and Gint. Hannah Hate is here as Molly O'Brien. And Jeffrey Combs is back as Brunt with special guest star Andrew J. Robinson as Garrick. We've got some fun stuff coming up, mm-hmm. but let's do it in the screening room.
Sean Connery and Nicholas Cage in the rock. Sean Connery. Sean Connery. We're going to get out of the rock. You know, there's a, a lot of uh, fan theories that I think have some validity. Uh, is uh, This is a James Bond sequel that we just don't realize. Uh, that, that didn't actually work out. Mike, I'm going to email you something for us to do on the show later in the uh, in the recap. Uh, we're gonna need, we're wait, gonna need do I have to, to do something on the fly is what you're saying? No, you're going to need to perform. Oh. But I'm going to send you what I what I need you to perform right now. Okay, Keith, while you do that, I'm going to show something JD sent me. JD's great with the graphics, and this uh, makes sense in this episode. I love it. When you're on vacation and the couple across the bar are looking at you like this. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think we need to ask the question, would you? Because that's going to be a hard yes. Mm, oh. <laughs> Extra. Oh, uh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so oh. our teaser begins as I bail us out of that. O'Brien is concerned. Pregnant Keiko is off on a remote planet in the Gamma Quadrant. He's nervous that something is going to go wrong with the baby. And he wonders aloud if she forgot that she's pregnant. Yeah, she's, Luckily, all, she's, all, she's all, all of a sudden into, what do they call it, uh, something sports. Uh, extreme sports. Yeah, repelling. Uh, but they then, uh, they then, I don't know if you caught this, they then basically described the plot of uh, Karate Kid 2. Like, she wants to climb this mountain and find this bonsai tree on the side of it and nurse it back to life. <laughs> oh, I was that's like, funny. Oh, that's Karate Kid 2. Oh, well, I don't think I've seen, have I seen Karate Kid 2? That's with the little drums, they're like... I don't think I've, I, I, I saw Karate Kid, the original one, when I was a kid. I don't know if I ever saw any of the... Karate Kid 2 has one of the best, I think, rom-com, and that's not a rom-com, but one of the best romantic theme, pop theme songs. Uh, Peter Cetera wrote it, and it's, um, I, I, sometimes, no, uh, oh my god, I forget it now. I'm thinking Celine Dion song, but it's a Peter Cetera song, and it's called The Glory of Love, Power of Love. Power of Love. No, no that's, that's uh, Huey Lewis, hold on. That's Huey Lewis. That's... I, 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 I've got to play five seconds of it. Oh god, here we go. All right. No, don't do it, because I'm going to have to cut it out. You have to sing it. You, you're allowed to listen to it, then you can sing it. You cannot play it on the board, because I will cut it from the episode. And it's going to delay it. We'll live forever, knowing together that we did it all for the glory of love. My third sentence of the 2,500 page recap <laughs> is, <laughs> luckily Dax is there to smack O'Brien down for thinking that she forgot being pregnant. Yeah. We go to Quark's and in there, a wildly gregarious Quark comes in and gives Rom free snail juice. We know there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Quark is returning from two weeks on Ferenginar and he's acting weird. He says he missed Rom. He closed a deal and saw his mother, and he's dying. And that is our teaser. So act one, we pick right up, and Quark explains that he has Doric syndrome. It's incurable and super rare. And he's got six days to live, which is a very specific diagnosis. Rom well, suggests- Well, we need that ticking clock, man. Obviously. Rom suggests a second opinion from Bashir, to which Quark says, Bashir, how good can he how good can he be? He doesn't even charge. Great. Just great insight into both the Ferengi sort of uh measuring stick. Uh it's a great comedic line, and it's also like a subtle dig at sort of our just medical like America. system. Yeah. It's just a hundred percent does like yeah. America. So Quark has to settle all of his affairs, settle his large debts. Rom suggests, here's a way you can do it. Sell your desiccated remains, as is Ferengi tradition, which we saw previously. When we thought the Negus was dead, Quark doubts that anybody would care. Rom points out that Quark briefly was the Grand Negus. And that's at least interesting as a bit of trivial trivia. 
in canon. But Quark dismisses it. He's got no respect on Ferenginar. He says, I'm inextricably linked to the Federation. I'm a joke back on Ferenginar, Starfleet's favorite bartender, the Synthahall King. What a legacy. Still, Rom convinces him that he should sell his desiccated remains on the Ferengi futures market. And we see his promo shot with his old nose on the screen behind him again. I thought that was You'd great think <clears throat> they, they could have just taken another headshot for Quark and not continually used the one from the uh, from the pilot, but probably they uh, they're doing these things on the fly. And they're like, we've already got it. Yeah, and I also think that it, it was more of a process to digitize stuff back then. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> they had all these old, like, because they had to take the film and then right. put it into, like, a JPEG form, which wasn't as, like, easy as it is. So they probably had but it. I had a scanner in 1996. Yeah, dude, I but used... they've, that was such a small thing in the props department for that week. And they were like, what do we have? You know what I mean? I used I used to scan my Phil Sims football cards and blow them up on like eight and a half by 11 and print them and put them on my wall to have more Phil Sims posters. I remember building my first web page for the, the band I was in and having this huge flatbed scanner. Space with, eight mafia. Mm -hmm, which a friend peed in one time. And because they thought it was, they were drunk, they thought it was a toilet. So they lifted the lid and peed on it. <laughs> uh, in your scanner. Side note, uh, didn't, couldn't afford another one. So just kept using it. So, but anyway, <laughs> We would have show flyers. I remember having to scan each show flyer and then try to find, get that, in, not just a JPEG or BMP, and then yeah, shrink it somehow point. and then get that mm -hmm. into an iframe. Oh, man, building web pages was hard back in the day. I built my first web page was for my high school drama department. Keith, so, do you know that before my first web page, when I was even younger, when I was like 12 or 13, I built a BBS. Remember those? No bulletin board system it was an ANSI bulletin board system on a 24-4 modem wow okay that is Keith and Mike are old our uh, segment within a segment check it out on the K&M Geekly channel <laughs> oof no wonder <laughs> everyone was like so tell us more about choking out that show slowly yeah all right so six subscribers and going strong five of them are me yeah. <laughs> two are me <laughs> Uh, please subscribe, just, just, just so I can sleep tonight. Oh my god, he just Jeb Bushed. Please clap. All right, deep cut. So, uh, did, did we even went further to Howard Dean? Okay, so Keith and Mike talk politics over on Kane and Geekly. Uh, That's right. Howard Dean is a very nice man. I've very, met him multiple yeah. times. So uh, later on Ops, we see a runabout come through the wormhole, and it's on fire and they request an emergency medical beam out. And of course, it's our heroes. O'Brien rushes to the infirmary to find that Kira is there on a bed while Keiko is in surgery. O'Brien asks about the baby. I think Colm does some really good acting in this mm -hmm. scene because like, we don't. there's no peril happening there, but from his point of view, like it's real. He asks about the baby and Kira announces, baby's fine, but it's in me now. She's she played that way too cutesy and coy in my opinion. Like, let's get the details out straight. Baby's great. Complication. It's in my belly now. They she went she waxed poetic and comedic for like five minutes to like. I know they were teasing it out for us, but it was very unkira. Well, you know she's she, she's 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 pregnant now. But, you know she's hungry. So in Act Two, Bashir explains there was an accident and Keiko was injured, pretty seriously injured. So yeah. she he moved the baby into Kira. Bashir reasonably asks, or O'Brien oh, reasonably asks, how that works with the different species. But Star Trek, the baby is going to have to stay there until they're born because of medical technobabble. Meanwhile, Quark is so. But it's not just technobabble. Which I what I appreciate is that they make an up they make an effort a little later to like further that right when when Keiko and Kira are talking she's like oh we don't get morning sickness we just sneeze a lot like it's stupid and silly but it is at least some interesting like, yeah, yeah yeah I mean the, we're not just gonna like techno babble it and push it aside well no I, I think you have something interesting there I mean it's like and and it is not unprecedented I mean like you know you have ligers and you have you know different species are able to procreate mm -hmm. with other species here on this planet and, uh, and it sort of actually made a little scientific sense to me. I was like, so 
How could we explain a, another humanoid species gestating so much shorter or months shorter, almost half the time of the gestation period? And they're like, oh, there's more blood vessels and more connections and more like support of the baby inside. More, yeah. Which would make sense. Well, then we don't want to disrupt that if that's what the baby's going to need. The question's yeah. going to be is like, so it, what's interesting is that what's even a little more scientific, a little more intense than even human surrogacy is that if there's that much more connections when the baby is born, what is there any genetic modification because gonna of be that? They're going to be part Bajoran. Yeah. Right. And like when when do do those genetic markers come in? I would I would think that the the baby's genetics are determined already. And so she's just a life support system, but um, it's all an interesting question. So uh Anybody out there, have you had an alien baby? How was your experience? I'm curious. Well, the emotional ramifications of surrogacy, I know a few friends who have had surrogacy. I mean, for sure. So oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, None of them, interestingly, lived with the mother. Oh, all right, cool. I mean, I, I live with my ex-wife, so what are you going to do? I'm just saying, like, that's a, it's a wrinkle here because yeah. there's they provide financial support and a lot of, like, yeah, physical, support, well, which but... is sort of what we're headed here. Yeah. So meanwhile, Quark is bummed out that there's only one bid on his desiccated body, and of course, it's from Rom, who bid his entire life savings. God damn, Rom is sweet. He's the sweetest guy. I would not bid my life savings for your corpse. Oh hell no. I would get a disc though. In fact, I told JD, I was like, you know, JD, I would get some JD if you put yourself out there. I would probably wait till the secondary market. I hope that's not what's coming in the mail. Oh me. Too. Uh, <laughs> I would wait till like eBay. Like I probably wouldn't be a first party buyer, but second party for sure. And uh, you, you, Keith, you'd, you'd, you'd buy me on the secondary market. Keith, I'd do what you did with that one toys. I'd wait till like someone else had purchased you in their estate sale. I'd try to get uh -huh. a deal deal. You know what I mean? Right, right. Okay. You want, you want discount Keith. All right. I just want enough. Charlie. I just want dead Keith live Charlie. Well, enjoy clipping that for out of context. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, Rom is sweet, but Quark doesn't want his charity. He's starting to regret all of his life decisions. He's single, middle-aged, and broke, but he does have a bookshelf full of trophies and toys like I do. And an awesome so chair. Obviously, he made good choices and has a big chair that looks like a male appendage. I didn't see that. Does it not? Now, now I see it, yeah. Yeah, but did but did you see see in the in the back corner there? Quark has a trophy and action figure shelf, just like I, I think I am Quark now, right? I think mm -hmm. like single, middle aged, broke with with uh, with action figures. Well, he has a bar. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I have dreams, Mike. It's I true. have dreams, uh -huh. and it turns out those dreams are worth about as much as Quark uh, Quark's personage. <laughs> That's until enough. until a giant bid comes in 500 bars of latinum for the entire lot from an anonymous bidder they wonder who it could possibly be maybe the nagus quark says of course it makes perfect sense he always liked me and ron says he used you when it suited his needs i don't think that's the same thing <laughs> yeah quark decides to accept the bid He's finally rich. He's going to die a winner and is thrilled. Later, Kira, now pregnant, goes to visit Keiko. She touches her own baby in someone else's body uh, in a surrogacy of sorts, which is really interesting. Meanwhile, Not Quark is making... I think it's direct, right? It's exactly I mean, no, that. No, it is. Yeah. It, well, it just... The baby started in her. Yeah. It's like a tra it was like a surrogacy transfer. Right. Right, which, you know, I don't know. We, we, I don't think we figured out how to do that yet, but it's, it is interesting. Do you know what I thought was really interesting? Just like... Keiko? Yes. Yes. But also when they discussed it, and I thought this was really interesting deal with current day politics, it wasn't the baby they were worried about, right? It, the baby was gonna was healthy, wasn't injured in the injury. It was, it was Keiko, and so it was for the life of the mother, Keith. The, dis mm. the medical decision was made for the life of the mother, which is something that, interestingly, all these years in the future, is still debated. Yeah. 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 I thought it was so on the nose. There's so many sort of, like, subtle, it's almost as if it's, like, P 
peeking ahead to the future and making commentary. Not just this, but also in the next scene coming. I'm going to just say it now. When Quark is sitting there, he's about to die, right? This is his last four days to live. And he's figuring out how to pay off all his debts because then, like now, death does not stop the debt man. Yeah, yeah, it does not. It does not. Uh, I had but a, you I had don't a friend. care. I had a friend who... Sorry, deal with it, it's long. I had a friend who, uh, unfortunately... Uh, passed away in her 30s uh, from cancer and the first thing her husband had to do after she passed away was freaking deal with her student loans and her debt because they didn't give a ish that she died of cancer in her 30s they wanted their got gd money which is like whew, yeah that's yeah. our country baby america so uh yeah jesus anyway uh but Quark it's easier is... to discharge when you're dead than uh, when you're alive. All right, well, there you go. So Quark is making all of these funeral arrangements when Bashir comes in and says, oh, I just got a message. You know, uh, turns out you, you don't have uh, a dork syndrome like we do. And uh, Quark is delighted because, not that he's going to live, first off, but because he's going to be able to sue his doctor. Also, America. Mm -hmm. Later that night, Quark So many is, screenshots you're getting here, Keith. Wow. So, so many, many, yeah. I mean, it's it's he makes a lot of excellent faces. So uh, later that night, Quark is woken up by a knock at the door, and it is Liquidator Brunt, who, of course, was the high bidder. And uh, he is not here. Oh, and he is here to collect on Quark's dead body. I thought the Predator Brunt was good in the first episode, but here he is just insidious and excellent. Oh, he wasn't, he wasn't, oh, oh you mean good as a performer? Yeah, I mean, I thought not, it was, like, yeah. Because he was never a good guy. No. Like, he reveled oh, yeah. in the, like, wanting, to, you could, you know, there's traipses there of him, you know, enjoying that he was taking Moogie and everybody for all they were worth. But here, his just, like, mustache twirling is just, uh, beautiful. Well, it's Jeffrey Combs. Yeah, baby. The legend, I mean, and... And you are paying attention that he also played Wayu. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's completely different, different though. Films. If you didn't know, you might not know. No, you'd have no idea. Yeah. 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 And of course, he does not care that Quark is dying, and he has a thousand ideas on how to defile Quark's remains. Quark tries to bribe Brunt to accept a refund, but of course, he rejects all offers, and he expects Quark to kill himself. Or have someone kill him. A contract is a contract is a contract. And Quark says, but why? I, what have I ever done to you? Done to me? And you call your brother an idiot. Nothing you've ever done to me has ever been more than a minor inconvenience. No, protecting your mother from an FCA audit and secretly settling with your striking employees were merely symptoms of a much more vile and insidious weakness. A weakness that makes me loathe you. Not for what you've done, but for who you are. A bartender? A philanthropist. I am not. You give your customers credit at the bar, you only take 30% kickbacks from your employees' tips, and you sold food and medicine to the Bajoran refugees at cost. That's not true, it's just above cost. Close enough. It was still a generous humanitarian gesture. You've gone Starfleet you might as well be wearing one of their uniforms. But there must be some accommodation we can make other than me killing myself. Of course there is. You can break the contract. Me? Break a Ferengi contract? Never. Never. I wonder if there's enough Ferengi left in you to stick to that. Part of me hopes you will break it, because then everything you and your family own on Ferenginar will be confiscated and sold to the lowest bidder. Funny joke. Makes no sense. Your mother will be forced to live in the streets, begging for scraps of food. And of course, no Ferengi will do business with you or even talk to you. You'll be cut off from all contact with your own people. You're a disease, Quark. A festering tumor on the lobes of Ferengi society. It is my job to cut you off. And I, I read all of that because I think it's important to... The world building and the story that we're telling here, right? Because he's threatening to excommunicate him, essentially. 
because the, uh, and we're going to get into it later, but the rules of acquisition and the sort of culture there, it's a religious fanaticism as much as anything else. And so, and so the, what Brunt has here is a, is a moral injury because of the way uh, Quark is, is adapting to life with the Federation. It is, it's a religious fanaticism happening here. Yeah, and what's important, and it's a great scene, and what's also important, because, and I think it's a great analogy, Keith, is that, you know, as evil as Brunt is, it never feels scene chewy because Quark, in his own sort of soliloquies and with Rom, clearly defines that he subscribes to the same church. Right. Yeah. He. he oh, had, absolutely. He's so obsessed in that first scene with Rom too. He's so obsessed with his worth and with how he's being viewed as a Federation puppet that clearly, when Brunt says these things, he's speaking to someone who's listening, who's 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 picking up what he's putting down. Oh, for sure. I mean, and and this episode is about a crisis of faith, you know. And this and and Quark has been flirting with this, and the, you know, again, similar to last episode where we have you know the world building and the character development going over four years we see quark who when we first meet him for season never questioned any piece of his faith whatsoever and this is him really wrestling with that and we've and we've seen him chip away at it for four seasons and this is really building on that i think it's really just i think it's excellent so uh did you check your email we have a scene to do is this now it, uh, coming up very shortly. Okay, so uh, later in O'Brien's quarters, Miles and Keiko discuss their situation. They're having a hard time being separated from their baby, and they don't want to have to make appointments to see their own child, which I imagine is part of the difficulty of surrogacy. And so this is where we get to a cut scene that did not make the episode. So oh. Mike and I are going to perform it for you. Would you like to play Odo or Kira? Um, oof, that's tough. What are you feeling? Uh, I'll be Odo today. Okay. So here's the scene. I'll read the stage directions too so you know what's happening. So uh, Odo is watching Kira looking herself over in a full-length mirror. So where's this glow, this radiance pregnant women are supposed to have? All I have is a sudden weight gain. It's not that noticeable. Uh, maybe not now, but just wait. Jillian showed me a picture of a human mother just before she gave birth. It looks like she swallowed the runabout. Whoa. Oh. Uh, suddenly, That's my line. Suddenly, Kira is startled. Whoa. Are you all right? I think it kicked. Odo what do I do? Uh, Odo smiles. She looks momentarily lost at sea. You don't have to do anything. It's my understanding the child will kick and move periodically. It did it again. This time, through the fear and confusion comes excitement and pleasure. Kira's on an emotional roller coaster that she didn't anticipate, and she's trying to hang on. Odo, I'm pregnant. Yes. I mean, I knew I was, but this is amazing. The baby kicks once again. Kira touches her com badge. <laughs> what part of her body is a combage? <laughs> <laughs> Kira to Keiko O'Brien, the baby's kicking. Can you come? I'm not, I'm not supposed to leave okay. my quarters. Julian... It's okay. I'll come to you. Kira stands up and immediately gasps again. It's difficult for her to move around, much less make it all the way to O'Brien's. Ah, what the hell. Kira to Ops, emergency transport, beam me directly to the O'Brien's quarters. Don't mention this to the captain. I wasn't even here. Kira dematerializes. That's cute. It's a cute scene. And yeah. I, like, uh, I, I understand why they had to cut it. They had to cut a couple of things from this episode looking at the script, I think for time, um... But uh, I like the uh, the Kira Odo friendship scene there, and obviously I, I do too. Ahead. But I think it the, the color it adds to the episode that the episode is missing a little bit. I think it does a great job of portraying the sort of the adjustment here for the O'Briens, but Kira seems to take it too much in stride at times. It feels a little yeah. too easy for her, and I think this scene adds. I think they thought that too, and that's why yeah. the scene existed. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's. We need the extended version where that scene wasn't cut. Mm -hmm. So uh, later, Rom tries to convince Quark to break the contract, but Quark won't do it. So he goes to Garrick to ask him to kill him. 
In Act 4, Garrick's like, all right. And Rom begs Quark not to do it. But Quark is a businessman and a loyal Ferengi. He lives by and believes in the rules of acquisition with religious fervor, as it is his religion. We go to the O'Brien's quarters, which is, I bet this would have, you know, gone straight in with that other scene. And Keiko and Kira discuss the differences between Bajor and human Bajoran and human pregnancies. They don't know how it's going to work because this is unprecedented. Then O'Brien and Keiko have an idea, but they don't want to pressure her. We all know what it is. It's not what you think, you horn dog. Uh, we don't know that sorry. that's not part of the deal. <laughs> it's never explicitly stated the rules of this acquisition. I mean, that's true. Headcanon. Like, we don't know what's happening in that other bedroom mm -hmm. that they clearly kicked Molly out of. So uh, later, we have the scene that was Mike's entire concept of Deep Space Nine for years and years and years. Quark is eating breakfast, then his neck is snapped by Garrick. We naturally reveal that we're in the hollow suite. Real Quark is not happy with this method of murder. And oh, that, he's look at that composite, very clear. Yeah, it's pretty good, though. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, you know, but here's here's what some... Okay, all right. So the, the composite part is the dead body in, in the front. front. It's the foreground, right. Because I was going to say, because you can see when you, as you're going back there, him blocking the light, mm -hmm. though it's not showing up on the wall behind him. The reflection there. Interesting. Uh, but I would imagine... No, because it's all one shot, because otherwise they would have just brought in a double mm -hmm. to be dead quark. Interesting. So uh, anyway, he's already ruled you can out. Tell, you can tell in the scale of... Because it seems to me like Andrew Robinson's hand, see how it's rested there? Yeah. It's in the, it's it's part of the, the foreground. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, good work, Avery. So uh, Quark has already ruled out a long list of deaths. And Garrick says, for a man who wants to kill himself, you seem strangely determined to live. Quark declares that he just wants to be surprised. Garrick says, yeah, no sweat. You'll never know what hit you. And later, a paranoid quark sneaks around his quarters, expecting to be murdered at any moment. Uh, funny bit. Very funny bit. He, uh, what goes, I love is that you had no time fear for him because you know Garrick is Garrick's never gonna do having that. fun with him yet. Because if he wanted yeah. him dead... Oh, yeah, dead. yeah. That would, not be, that would not be a problem for Garrick, but he does have a good sense of humor. So... Uh, Quark goes to sleep, and he wakes up in the Divine Treasury. Quark thinks he's dead, and doors open to reveal Gint, the first Grand Negus, who looks an awful lot like Rom, which is pretty funny. It's a dream, and he assumes that's why the Divine Treasury looks oh, like... Oh, is the Rom actor playing Gint? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Max. Uh, so, uh... And he says, I thought the Divine Treasury would look better than this, but this just looks like Trump's bathroom. <laughs> but it says, you have a lack of imagination. But Gint says, you, see, it's clearly Max. Yeah. You need to break the contract with Brunt. Quark says he can't because of the rules of acquisition. And Brunt says, who cares? They're made up. Ugh. Are you saying they don't matter? Well, of course they matter. That's why they're a best seller. But we're talking about your life here. The rules are nothing but guideposts, suggestions. Then why call them rules? Would anyone buy a book called Suggestions of Acquisition? Doesn't have quite the same ring, does it? Uh, this is the most direct dismantling of organized religion the show has ever done. Yeah, that's, yes. In fact, it's not only the best dismantling of... This episode, spoiler for the end, so we'll save you some time, is almost without edit my entire religious philosophy. Why I have a problem with organized religion, why I think it's ridiculous people don't see through that veil, but also that last scene, which some could say is too convenient, I think is probably the definition of what I think religion is or should be, spirituality. Well, and as somebody, you know, you, you were raised in the Catholic faith, and went through that whole process and then sort of came out of it, which gives you a, a perspective not unlike Quark's. It's in, why I think I love the scene is because my perspective was never needed to be altered. From the beginning, 
every yeah. CCD class, every sacrament I went through, I always thought to myself, this is clearly, I saw through the veil the whole time. I was like, this is yeah. clearly not true. Or it's like, a because they Metaphor. define they define to you what a parable is, right? Right. And then you recognize when you zoom out that the whole thing is a parable, and it's and and it's face value very beautiful, right? It's just a story. To, it isn't without value. Yeah, but at the same time, like, but now you're trying to tell me it's also real. It's like, literal, literal and real. That goes into the face of everything you just taught me Jesus was doing, right? The guy you're right. telling me Jesus was wouldn't be into all this, right? Mm. Right. That's it. And, and all this... he is saying. Right or what? And what I think what people love about religion when you boil it down and when you when, let me save it. I'll save it. All right, all right, cool, cool, cool. I'm I'm interested in all of your thoughts on this. Uh, so uh, then the then Brunt shows up in his private vision to remind him of the consequences of breaking with orthodoxy. You're going to lose everything. You're going to be excommunicated from your entire culture and all of your money, which is pretty dire like you know his his uh you know his obviously this faith this sect is much more extreme you know it's it, 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 like many of the more extreme religions here where you can if you break from orthodoxy we're going to throw you out and excommunicate you from the entire thing um like scientology or something like that or others i won't mention but you all know what i'm talking about uh but uh Anyway, it doesn't Brunt just starts... have to be religion too. Cult of personality, you know, just cult <laughs> yes, mindset. Another... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So Brunt starts choking him, and Quark wakes up. If he wants to live, he's going to have to break the contract. In the real world, Quark goes up to Brunt and does indeed that. This is exactly what Brunt wanted. And Brunt shuts down the bar and bans all Ferengi commerce. He immediately seizes all of Quark's assets, leaving Quark now destitute. Everybody leaves. I've I gotta write that down before I forget. Um, so yeah, so everything's gone. Later, Kira arrives in the O'Brien's quarters. She's going to stay with the family until the baby is born, and she is now Aunt Nerese. Very, very sweet. Um, you would think they could like find larger quarters as opposed to uh, where's where's Molly sleeping now? Got kicked out of her bedroom. Yeah, it's also like aren't they busy? They only have a lot to do. Well, she can still get to all of her things. I mean, she still has her quarters. It's just down the hall. I know. I'm just my, that's my point. Is like ninety percent of these people's time is working. So like, so she's just gonna hang out there. What you could you didn't have to move in for that. Well, but like I don't know. It's different. You're there for dinner. You sleep in yeah, there. I don't okay. know. It's a it's, a, it's it, This is an emotional thing. I guess Kira's single thing. these days, so she's got, you know, like... Or she's still what? bumping with... Uh, with Shakar? Shakar, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think she I think she, I think she she is. But uh, we don't know what their arrangement is. It doesn't... Uh, it does not preclude her from oh. being in the throuple with uh, right. O'Brien and Keiko. We don't mm -hmm. know. So, uh, anyway. Later. Quark sits alone in his now completely empty bar. Everything not bolted down has been cleared out. He even has to give up his clothes tomorrow. Rom comes up. He is proud of Quark, but he has no idea what's next. Then Bashir comes in with some brandy that he doesn't want. Followed by Dax, who has some horribly ugly glasses that she just wants to get rid of. Then Cisco comes in and says, uh, we need to store some furniture in here. And he even allows Quark to charge him a storage fee for the furniture. I, I love the, the just still doubles down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful life, Quark, because all of your friends have, uh, have come in and helped you rebuild your life, which is, you know, says you have no assets. Well, look at all of your friends. And in the final scene, I actually went in because I really wanted to see what the stage directions were for the final beat with Quark. Because he comes around and nearly gets out the words, thank you. But doesn't. But nothing in the stage directions says he does any of the sort. Mm. So Quark almost saying thank you or wanting to say thank you is an Armin choice. 
or possibly an Avery Brooks choice. I'm so, I was looking for the script myself because there's another scene earlier where I can't remember the specifics, but he's, he says someone else's name in in error. It's, he's talking to Rom and he says someone else's mm -hmm. name and he goes, or Rom, whatever your name is. And it seemed like a, such a random choice. And I wondered if it was just a really good take of someone who messed up a line and then, because he's flustered and I wanted to look it up, but I forget now. I'd have to rewatch oh. it. But anyway. But I, I think it's a, it's an excellent, whether that was Armin or Avery, whatever that choice was, to add that little beat of him wanting to say thank you, but not being, not allowing himself. That was my right. comment, was that ch playing that straight was the best choice. And I, they might have flirted with a couple of different options. He could have made a joke or, but, because he often disarms, uh, right? Like yeah. the character Quark would disarm that, but he couldn't. I think he's overcome. And I think that was beautiful. That's what makes it work. Because it could be, once again, it could be too convenient, right? But right. It, it sells it. It sold it. Great. Great. I, I have I've always loved that ending. All right. Let us do some adjudication in the important segment. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let us discuss. Hold on, I gotta do Any, some. I gotta do some work here. Yeah, do some work because you had to rebuild. They they updated OBS. All right. That's right. They updated OBS. Made a lot of changes. All right. So uh, wormholes. So only one I want to discuss because I I I can't tell if it's a wormhole or if it might if maybe it's just a loose thread, a dangling Chad, or a. Here's the point. So when. First discussing the consequences of breaking said contract. There was a bunch of personal stuff, but there's also a bunch of stuff that affected Mookie and his family and everything being dis destroyed on Ferenginar. So yep. though it seems like the consequences that we beautifully tie up with the bow at the end, or it's just his bar is shut down, all his assets are taken and they fix that, are all those other things still happening to down on Ferenginar, to Mookie and the family? Yeah, I would, yeah, I would assume so. So it's yeah, not so much I mean, a wormhole as just like a gaping, festering wound we've left unattended. It is definitely a dangling Chad. So uh, yeah, that there, there are, he's he's making this decision for more than just himself. And you know, I think it's fair to say that Mugi would want him to live, mm -hmm. right? And she's probably uh, but, got some another nest egg squirreled away somewhere. She's very oh old. yeah no I I I think. She's she's got six sixteen different ways that she's protected uh, because she's very very bright. But, so, but yeah, so Brunt gets everything he wants here. He does, yeah. Yeah, Brunt Brunt wins for sure. Other than what he really wanted was Quark to be punished, and yeah. in the end, he's not really. Yeah, and also because... it sh it does show a great scene there when he's, there's two times in this episode where they show how Brunt responds to physical threats. And he's yeah. very much uh, a, a oh, he's a coward, of a course. ninny nanny, yeah, yeah. And I love that they give Quark that last little Achillea, and there's a response from 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 him. Anyway, anyway, so that's my only wormhole. Do you have anything else? Uh, no, other than sort of like the techno babble of whatever baby moved over. No, I, I like I. The only thing I'd written down was the Moogie of it all. Mm -hmm. Was was that's just a piece of it that I. There's there's more more to be done there more to be done there so uh, it's hard to judge at this point whether it's a wormhole or a plot thread let's talk best moment man there's so many good ones uh, I think the ending is really beautiful but for me just for me and I know I don't think it's objectively the best but for me the scene in the grand treasury or whatever mm -hmm. where they are able to in one scene in a comedic Ferengi scene, basically elevator pitch the sheer hypocrisy of like over organized religion uh, yeah. is wonderful to me, and it just shows what sci fi can do through just like the most the thinnest veil of of analogy, right? <laughs> right, right. It, it's it's wonderful. It's just like ten out of ten, no notes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really interesting, and and we. I, I think the show's perspective 
is constantly making the distinction, and this is true of the, the Bajoran, the Klingon, and all these other, making the distinction between religion and faith, as they are two very different things. Yeah. And and I think that they're they're making it here too, and uh, it's it's very very interesting. Um, I, I think that's a it's a great moment for me. My favorite moment is, you know, the the whole "It's a Wonderful Life" of it all. That always stuck with me. That that moved me every time I saw it, and I think that it's would not have been earned. Quark would not have deserved this in season two. Yeah. And, you know, like, when he was, like, a stone-cold criminal and, like, putting people's life at risk. But I think by now, he really has, you know, again, he has changed enough to be excommunicated from his entire society. And it has cost him a great deal to adapt, to grow, and and form these relationships with all, all of these people. So, of course, they're going to be there to back him up. And... um because, you know, his his growth and his kindness and his whatever comes at a great cost. And I really like how they did that. You know, is it a little twee? Is it a little trek? Yeah. I don't really care. I'm fine with that. Like, I, I, I feel like it was earned. Um, and so yeah, my it, best... Go, go ahead. No, no, no. Please, please. My best specific moment is the unscripted almost thank you from Armin. Yeah, and I because. think as we get older, Keith, we recognize that, you know, it's television, and so they obviously the stakes are heightened or whatnot, but it's sometimes the change in ourselves, the change in our lives is so small, and we live with it daily, that maybe the effort was greater than we thought, but we don't recognize it as much as other people recognize it. And so yeah, that's true. here, it's a beautiful moment in those times in life. I'll tell you, we, we spoke on, I think it was on my birthday or whatnot, and you were talking about some changes you had seen in me personally. And mm. that really caused, I had a lot of things came up because I didn't recognize a lot of those things. And it's till someone else kind of projects them back mm. to you where you realize that, oh, things have changed, right? And that's also sometimes your ego doesn't let you accept those things because maybe you don't want to say that you need it to, right? <laughs> sure, yeah. And so Quark is the last to know, right? right. He's the last yeah. to know of the change that his friends that mm. and 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 even he probably doesn't feel that he's worthy of those. So anyway, it's it's like you said that moment does encapsulate quite a bit, and that's what the show does here well. And I this episode specifically does well is that there's so many subtle things that have been earned, and Avery recognizes because he's been with it that they've been earned, that he could infuse. So yeah, that's a great pick. Yeah, well, I I think the being the last note, it's a really it's a really good point. Like the the benefits and the cost of change is usually hard to recognize in the moment because change is slow. Yeah. Change is slow. And so the and and so we you know we see it in our relationships, right? As we change, as we grow, there is usually both a benefit and a cost. You know, like the the people in our lives everyone is either changing or not changing around us. And so even our growth in a positive way pushes us further away from some people who are not changing and bringing us to other things that you know that that were more appropriate for so whether it's with your family with your friends with your partner you know change begets change and that sometimes there's cost and a benefit to it and we're seeing both for quark both a cost and a benefit and like you said, he is the last person to recognize any of those things, which is great. Speaking of great, let's talk about some stem bolts. You get some stem bolts. Hell yeah, they are self-sealing. Here are some stem bolts for you. All right. Yes. Okay. I have varied thoughts here, so I'm gonna, I'll try to be succinct, but. This episode hits me at a really interesting time. As I find myself softening as I get older, mm -hmm. when it comes to religion and spirituality and space for all of these things, but also at sort of like a political spot, right? 
thought the first time Trump was up for election that that's when I was having this this crisis of conscience. But it turns out it's the second time. It's having gone through sort of what that experience was. I'll try to keep it. I'm not even not even for political correctness, just for space. Whatever that experience was for you, uh, and then followed by a space of relative calm here, right? So forget the right. specifics, just a, a clear uh, right. A and B, right? And now we're being faced with, okay, your choice between those two things, what will we do with it? Because yeah. there's no more scary what ifs. We he Trump specifically is telling you what he is going to do and what he wants, yeah. right? And that's scary. And in fact, John Stewart said it really beautifully on Monday. Uh, the thing that really strikes me is that whether you believe, you know, if you want to say it's really about uh, being pro-life or being anti this or and whatever your feelings are on the specific, specific uh, issues, the fact that he and the current Republican Party feel that they can take that and define it as patriotism. They've co-opted patriotism mm -hmm. and made the heathen Democrats or anybody who doesn't believe in those sort of things not patriotic is really the- And, and that's that's not Trump. That started like 9-11. Sure. Yeah. But that is the thing that is really the scariest of all to me. Now, granted, I'm very privileged to not be being personally affected by a lot of these other. Uh, right. So that's not my point. My point is, and I feel that I've often felt religion is that way, right? That mm. if you don't subscribe to one of these defined religions, then you are an other. Then you clearly don't believe. My sister does it all of the time. She says to my to my nieces and nephews, "Oh well, he, Michael, my Uncle Mike doesn't believe in God," and I say, "Well, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is." Look, I'm fine with, as I get older, I recognize that everybody is a hypocrite. We are all just just draped in our own hypocrisies because nothing is black or white, basically. You have, in order to subscribe to one thing, you have to, and so often I, I in my harder line days, if you were super Catholic or religious, then I, I couldn't take you seriously because I could list you all of the ways you're a hypocrite. Well, you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this. And, I've now come to recognize that you have to leave space, right? That, and this this episode, for me, boils it down, right? They point to all the reasons, they they tear down all the hypocrisy of, of, of religion. Quark does it, it's about Ferengi, but it could very well just be us. It could pick your religion, pick your politics, whatever, they're sort of telling you in black and white it's just stories it's stories in which side of the story you want to believe and you you eliminate the things you don't want to do and you hype up the things you do want to follow or you're good at to make it easy and to make the story in yourself make sense but then at the end despite quark's faults despite the ways he's wronged them despite the ways in which he part particularly might deserve some of his comeuppance they choose to help up a person who needs helping. And if that- and, and to reward his growth, not his perfection. If that's not to me what I think religion, community, spirituality is, I don't know how better to define it than that or scene. should be, at should least. Be. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately, most religions boil it down to just that. Do unto others as you'd want done for yourself, help out your fellow man, despite what they've done or who they are. It's not easy to do all of the time. In fact, it's pretty convenient for them at this point. It's very easy for them to help him out. They got all this stuff, right? But that's not the point. And uh, I just find it beautiful. Oversimplified, sure. Over, but I just, it, all of those beats hit to me at a time in life where it's, it's, it's saying exactly how I feel, right? Mm. I am imperfect. I struggle to ask for help. I need. I know that I should be able to ask for help for more, but I know that I've cultivated a community of folks in my inner circle that would help me, and that is pretty awesome. And when you boil it down to a lot of my great people in my life that I look to who are religious or are involved in a lot of religious activities or church, I, should, I shouldn't say religious, church-based church activities. Well, yeah. 
the number one reason is because of that community and because of a, a group of people who will help and who are doing right. it for the right reasons, right? And I find nothing wrong with that, right? I have, I think that is a great reason to be involved in a church or whatnot. I don't think it is necessary, but I understand it. And so I would never scoff at people. And I, that's, and, and this episode I think is beautiful because it's, it's not drawing a hard line, right? And I don't know, I just felt very seen. But I also mm. think that the performances are so strong or so many times they, they flip, uh, they subvert expectation. You think the whole episode's gonna be about Quark and then at the very end, he's gonna find out he's not dying. But no, they do it early so that the it's it's the ramifications of that that the right. whole episode is about. The Kira, Kira is, is also religious here, right? She is so altruistic and so giving to them in what is a very difficult time. And yeah. you would think that they use the Star trek -y medicine of it all, the sci-fi of it, to actually tell a really s simple, beautiful, and story about an uh, you don't talk 96 we're not talking about surrogacy we're not talking about adoption right. we're not talking about but people who are dealing with pregnancy and the difficulty getting pregnant and which is current events this episode is so ripped from the headlines in 1996 right. for 2024 yeah. that it's insane yeah uh the O'Brien and everything is and Avery brings such a touch of ground even in what could be you could put in the you can't even put it in the bucket of funny Ferengi episodes it's not this is very grounded it is very character driven I really love this episode I'm going to it, I think I liked it more than the quickening although I don't know if it has the impact that the quickening had like long term so I'm going to say 93.5 self-sealing stem bolts I really loved it yeah well I mean yeah there you go I mean it's it's a, uh, it's you know this is an episode that I frequently sort of forget about. I remember that moment. I remember that it's a wonderful life moment, but I I don't really like think of of it often. And it's you know it's one of the many episodes of Deep Space Nine that I when I watch it I'm like oh you know that was good. Like it's it you you sort of forget how good it is till you see it. Mm -hmm. um, so I yeah, I think you put a lot of that really well, and I I don't have a lot to add to that other than um it's great to have these two back-to-back -back episodes about character growth about characters who have started one place and come a long way and through struggle mm. become better deeper people who when we met them were very much individuals very much on their own journey by themselves looking out for what they wanted and establishing that they are now part of this family this family you know we you know piloted the whole bunch of completely disparate people with things different disparate things that they wanted and didn't want who are now genuinely a family like it's aunt kira now and and everyone is stepping up to support Quark, and that's what any good series does. You start with a pilot of people who don't know each other, and you make them a family. But I think having these two back-to-back -back pieces, where where we really have grown to understand and love these characters, right up before we you know get into the bigger arc, you know, season finale. Obviously, we're going to get back into the big picture here it makes it all the deeper all of the stakes of all of these things are much deeper and much more interesting because of the consequences of this character building and this world building and you know and again it's uh I, 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 as jason or somebody was saying that the benefits of 26 episodes as opposed to 10 mm. because we can we can do all of this so that when the stakes get crazy in the universal level. We care so much more because we're so much more invested in these people and their stories and their growth. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, for me, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's very good. I wish we had a little bit more time with the Kira O'Brien. I think that arc, I think, had the deleted scene been in there, I think it would have been better and felt a little bit less rushed and a little bit less of like uh we got to deal with this somehow <laughs> right um the less of the real world 
practical problems. This is a solution to that. And there's more storytelling there to be done. But we're going to follow up with a, a lot more of that moving forward. So the, la the last thing I will say, uh, so it gets 89 self-sealing stem bolts. But you, uh, you, you're you you talking about uh, Trump and his plans. Sorry, we're going to get political for a hot second here. Uh, in terms of like, you know, knowing what he wants to do moving forward, here is my pitch to uh, for the D to the DNC and the Democratic National Convention. Forget all of the speeches about how you want to characterize him and what he wants to do, that kind of stuff. What I want you to do on your big giant screen before you, just put up a live screen capture of Trump's website where it has his agenda and what he wants to do next term. Just show, read aloud his stated objectives from his own website, from the campaign's own website. You you know, like explain it as much as you need to give context. You don't need to add any sauce to it. Just read it. And I think that's all you need to know. So literally like, you know, you don't have to get into all the other stuff. This is what he wants to do. This is what he says he wants to do. Just make people aware of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to your point, it's very much, you know, it, as complicated and as, as fraught as it is with, with stakes, at the end of the day, it is also a very distinct choice. It is just, you want this, or do you want this? Well, and, and it's it's just, we get so caught up in the cult of personality, mm -hmm. in the in the excitement, in the drama, in the, the sort of like, you know, schoolyard, you know, verbal nonsense of it. Okay, all of that's, it's really entertaining, super entertaining, but like, what really matters is like, what they're actually going to do if he gets back in charge. Just just read it. And if you're like, I want all those things, then that's what it is. But if you don't want those things, that's actually what matters. Mm -hmm. It's not so much about the name calling and the whatever, whatever, whatever. So anyway, uh, I apologize to everyone for uh, for getting into that, but he just it, it's a thought that's been going on in my head. So thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Thank you for watching KM Entertainment. <laughs> if you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash KM.